Hello. Just want to make sure that everybody can hear me as I get started. So if you can let me know, if you can hear me in the chat, that would be awesome. Woohoo. All right. Well, thank you for being here today. I am going to get started. This is going to be a pretty laid back stream today. I just want to do an introduction of kind of what I'm going for here, tell you a little bit about myself, and then um, see what kind of questions you all have. So let me see here. Hey, everyone, just checking out the chat, um, trying to get <laughs> familiar with this. So I thought I, I really want to learn TensorFlow.js. This is going to be awesome. And I was like, hey, why don't I learn how to live stream at the same time? Because that sounded like a really great idea at the time. So uh, bear with me. I'm very excited to be doing this. I am also learning how to navigate all of the um, different parts of live streaming and learning. So I am using OBS Live Studio and I can't figure out how to <laughs> get um, it so I can see what's happening on both screens. I'm not really sure if this is moving around in the way that I'm seeing it move around on my screen, but my head keeps moving up and down. Um, so just give me a second and I will try and make sure that um, my head is not in fact moving around in various ways. <laughs> so um, let me see, give me a second. All right, no, it's just cutting it off on my, my OBS screen for whatever reason. So I will just go ahead and ignore that and get started. Thanks, Glenn. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody, for bearing with me. Maybe it's just because my screen is too small. There we go. Made a little bit bigger. That looks better. Um, Okay, so I guess, so today, like I said, it's going to be a pretty laid back. I just want to give an overview of kind of what I'm hoping to do here. And okay, so I have this system of sticky notes um, and they're normally not organized like this, but my five-year-old, they're like, they're organized in a way that makes sense to me, but looks chaotic to other people. My five-year-old came in the other day and she said, these, these need to be cleaned up. And so she organized my sticky notes and now I'm not really sure what they are telling you. Oh, there's some interesting stuff back there. That, that Those are my big ideas for <laughs> the next year. So if you can zoom in on those, um, you will get insight into, yeah, random sorting for the win. Um, so this is what it's like to have a bunch of kids in my house. And this is what it's like to watch a live stream with me because I'm going to learn how to focus both on talking about what I'm doing and on reading the chat because I get super distracted. And I was um, on Jason Langsdorf's uh, stream about a month ago talking about TensorFlow.js and there would be these random noises that popped up and I got so distracted. I just had a really hard time focusing because I wasn't expecting all of these things. And so um, I don't think that you can make any random noises on my stream. Not right now. I have to learn how to do the other stuff first. Um, but since we are recording this, welcome everybody. It is great to have you here with me today. I do not <laughs> want any random noises again. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm doing this. So I'm a front-end developer. I'm interested in exploring all kinds of technology that helps me to understand how to solve problems in the world around me. Um, and so this is what this series of live stream is going to be. It's going to be me learning TensorFlow JS. It's been one of those things that's been on my list for a while now. And I've been really inspired by watching other people around me using it. And so I don't know all the answers. 
I'll learn how to find them if I don't know how. I will probably get some things wrong, but I will do my best to correct them. And I hope that some of you will be going on this journey with me and learning together. So I really believe in the power of community learning, and I'd really love to see that as part of this experience. And so the nice thing I think about this is that this is gonna be, I think, 11 or 12 parts to this series, so every Tuesday at this time. And we're gonna be using Gantt Laborde's Learning TensorFlow JS book from O'Reilly Media. And Gantt will be making it an appearance sometime on here. Um, so I'm gonna drop some links there. Got Gantt Laborde's link, and that's for his Twitter. And if you wanna grab the book, then you know, you can definitely learn along with me. I'm not going to do all of the examples of the book. Um, I'm going to go through some stuff, give the highlights, talk about things that I think are interesting. But if there's something that you want to know or you want to talk about, definitely drop that in the chat and I'll make sure I save that in my notes. And um, if there are questions, you can ask questions at any time. Uh, and you can also, you know, DM me on Twitter. So... Um, let's see, yes, and I'm gonna be doing some giveaways from the mad scientist himself, the awesome Gant Laborde. And so today is just a very laid back conversation so I can get comfortable live streaming and start sharing some of the ideas and concepts about machine learning and TensorFlow.js. Uh, this is basically chapter one of the book. I'll show you a couple of things at the end, just some applications. And if there are things that you've seen, examples of TensorFlow.js that you really like and think are cool, feel free to drop those in the chat as well. Or you can also um, throw them onto Twitter. Uh, you can respond or, or just uh, message me on Twitter. Send me a tweet with your favorite TensorFlow.js demos. Uh, let's see. So a little bit about me for everybody who is new here. I have a background um, in community organizing. I taught college English for 10 years and then I went through trauma and that's when I started learning how to code. And this also inspires my journey of learning more about TensorFlow.js, which we'll get to in a minute here. Um, through this, I um, created this community called Virtual Coffee. So if you're not from Virtual Coffee and you're here, welcome. We There's a link to Virtual Coffee in the chat. And we're a community of developers at all stages. And this kind of also inspired me because some of my favorite people on Virtual Coffee are doing really cool things. Uh, Nick Taylor, who is here, Nikki T online, uh, is always somebody that I love to watch streaming because he does such a good job of teaching other people. And this is also how I got connected more with Gantt. And we actually had him on the podcast, and this is not a plug for our podcast, but if you want to check out the episode, there's a link to that too. Um, and and so when I met Gantt, I, he kind of opened my eyes to all of the very, very cool thing. <laughs> oh, you are reading my post-it notes. <laughs> um, now I am distracted. Sorry. Um, okay, so I met Gant, and Gant is like the mentor extraordinaire, and he is is my Yoda. There, my password is definitely not on one of those post-it notes. Um, and so I he I love the way that Gant makes things really relatable to what you're doing in your life. He makes it exciting, he makes it interesting. And one of the reasons why I thought, okay, maybe I could live stream this is because I have a background in teaching. And Gantz, <laughs> Jamin, the job is not to distract me. Um, Gantz book has all of this stuff laid out. It's um, very easy to understand or to break down. And I'll say, like, these concepts can be a little bit challenging, and I like that I have this resource to kind of guide me along and help me to understand what, what's going on. And so I, I also appreciate that there are goals for each part of the book, each chapter, 
And those are kind of the things that we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to be doing a little bit about the history of AI, talking about some of the common terms, and jumping around to the things that inspire me. So again, if there's something that's inspired you about TensorFlow.js, something that excites you about machine learning, drop it in the chat. If you have questions about it, go ahead and drop that too, because I would love to uh, answer your questions or find the answers for the next time. Like I said, this is going to be, I think, an 11 or 12 part series. So there's plenty of time to learn lots of stuff together. Um, good to see you too, Jetty. So where should we start? I guess at the beginning and how computers have given us superpowers, right? Um, I always loved superhero shows when I was a kid. X-Men was my favorite. And I love this idea that humans can do a lot of things, but we can't do everything, right? And so when we start to tap into artificial intelligence, AI, we think we can think of it, I, I like to think of it like a, a fast pass. So if you've ever been to Disney World, they have very, very long lines and you can get fast passes that, hey, Dan, um, that you can skip ahead to the front of the line, right? And so for us, AI gets us to the front of the line. It lets us build and to create new things. And yes, absolutely. Um, Whoa. Oh, wait, what's the quote? With power comes great responsibility. What movie is that from? Um, and what is the quote actually? Because I'm pretty sure that's not it. But somebody, somebody knows what that quote is. Um, so there, there, this has the potential to change things. Thank you, Spider-Man. Um, back to superheroes because this is, this is where we're going here. Um, <laughs> We have the power, so we've got this power, we have these powers through machine learning and AI, and this is where you can bring your big imagination. And I think that anything that lets us bring big ideas to take fiction, science fiction, and turn it into nonfiction is really, really awesome. I am going to backtrack a little bit now. Uh, just to help us understand a little bit about artificial intelligence. And so Gantt does a really nice job of breaking this down in the book. And I love this idea of going into Greek mythology and, and seeing the god of it, invention. Um, he created an automated bronze robot that walked and acted like soldiers. So we're looking all the way back in history and we're seeing that this is an idea that, that, that people are excited about then, too. Um, and we think about these things and how we can make them a reality. We think about the concepts of machines, how they can work autonomously, how they can work intelligently. And yes, there are plenty of dystopian science fiction movies and novels out there that make this seem really scary, but I think that also it allows us to see a lot of things that we can change for the better too. So, you know, there are different stages of this and there are different ways of um, seeing this progress, right? So you can build a robot, but you need electricity and you need speed to keep up with humans. And when computers came around, this kind of allowed this all to progress a little bit more, right? So in the 1950s, or maybe in 1950, the term artificial intelligence was coined. And then this is when we started to combine these disciplines of philosophy and science and mythology, and when they all started to become a reality. Um, I'm not sure that I really welcome AI overlords. I think um, maybe we need to put some rules in place and, and figure out what exactly that means. But I think that, that maybe they could be doing better than some, some of the current human overlords right now. So <laughs> it would be uh, an interesting experiment, I guess. Um, so um, let's see. Two, two, two. Um, okay, so when we talk about intelligence, what we think about is that 
this is mimicking human-like activity, thinking, right? And it can be a limitation too. I was reading this quote once where there was a group of Chinese scientists, I believe, and they were sent to the United States to learn more about science fiction. Um, I wish that I had that quote available because I'm not exactly sure where it's from. But the, the point was they, they had technology for things and they had the ability to do things. And what they were really looking for was the inspiration in science fiction that can allow us to develop these new ideas and these new cool things. And so I think all, all of these things coming to play is what makes things really exciting. Um, so we are limited by what we can think of, but when we push outside those boxes, then that's when stuff starts to get really fun. We see lots of progression in AI. Tic-tac-toe is a big one. I know that I had to do that when I was in boot camp. Um, we had to, I had to program AI tic-tac-toe, and so I would play the, the computer that I programmed, and I'm not sure that it ever beat me, which I think is probably a sign that I did not program it well enough, or maybe I just didn't have enough humility to allow myself to be beat by my autonomous self. <laughs> Um, but there's, there's lots of cool things that we're talking about now and different ways that we're talking about AI. And so when we think about this, we're thinking about, you know, how are we training these models? What are we doing to enable this progression? So we, we want to do something that's requires more intelligence than maybe a toddler. And so we kind of see this exploration throughout history. And then in the 1960s, that's when we get the term machine learning. Arthur Samuel is the one that created this idea. And so what that meant was programs couldn't grow to fit into the data and grasp concepts the programmers couldn't translate into code. So we're seeing this evolution and this change. And then there's kind of a period of time where nothing really big or exciting is happening. Well, there's probably big and exciting things, but um, I'm skipping ahead 40 years when I think that the big and exciting stuff happens in the 2000s when we start to see researchers using um, graphics processing units and we see this change and the shift in this understanding of what we can be doing with AI. And this is when we start programming computers to read handwritten digits. And so deep learning was capable of reading and adapting to handwriting 98% of the time. And so we're training computers to outperform human capabilities. And this is what happens. So we're training it to read handwriting and it starts to do a better job of humans. Um, a better job than humans. And that's really what we want to see from this, right? We want accuracy. And one of my favorite books is called um, Deep Medicine by Dr. Eric Topol. I don't have the link for that um, right this second, but I'll drop that in later. And he talks a lot about using machine learning to provide diagnoses for patients, for image recognition. And this is kind of the thing that really inspired me um, in this journey into machine learning because I, when I, I mentioned that I went through a trauma, and so I went to a talk by Guy Royce, and I think I have, oh, here we go. Here's his Twitter information here. When I was first learning how to code, and, oh, thanks, Nick. And... What he was talking about was Dungeons and Dragons and machine learning. And I know nothing about Dungeons and Dragons. And at the time, I knew nothing about machine learning. But it was the only talk in the track where I thought I might get something out of it. Or maybe it'll be interesting. And I learned a lot about Dungeons and Dragons. But I also learned about training models and about image recognition. 
And when I went through the trauma, what happened was um, two of my organs ruptured into each other. And no one diagnosed me immediately. I went for a bunch of tests afterwards. I had an ultrasound. And nobody found results for a couple of weeks. And when I heard this talk, in my head, I thought, oh, this could have diagnosed the condition before it happened. And through image recognition, there are things that um, would prevent this type of thing from happening. There were a number of um, people who read the reports, who saw the images, and didn't look for things they didn't expect. So there was images that showed that there was a rupture, but that's not what they were looking for. They were looking for something else because it was outside of their imagination that this could have happened. But if we had uh, images of healthy organs, if we had images of the way things should look, uh, there should have been a clear comparison that showed, okay, there is a hole the size of a 50 cent piece or <laughs> there's damaged tissue here. And then I would have had a diagnosis much sooner. And even before that, there were indications that could have happened. So there's a difference between what a healthy organ looks like and what an unhealthy organ looks like. And if that was done, knowing that I was at risk for this rare thing to happen, then I, they would have been able to take precautions. They would have been able to change the, my treatment plan and this all would have been addressed. And so for me, this comes back to that idea of how do we solve problems in the world and how do I get involved in that? And so this is kind of like the, the inspiration for, you know, why, why did I start to go down this path? Because there's more accuracy in many of the things that we do with machine learning than there is from humans because there's limitations, right? If you are looking at an image and you're looking for a certain thing, you might overlook something else that's happening in that image. Um, and I know in... in um, Deep medicine, there's a number of different instances where that's happening. And I, I think this was, it was either in that book or in Dr. Topol's podcast. He was talking about um, depression. And so we treat depression in ways that's kind of just throwing what we think might work at the problem, but we don't really understand what works. And so there was a study done at Carnegie Mellon Institute in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where they did these brain scans. And through these brain scans, and it was a, a pretty small sample size of um, subjects, but they identified there were four different types of brains. And based on those four different types of brains, they would respond to different treatments. And so one of the treatments they were looking at was um, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT. And through this image recognition of the brain, they determined that um, two out of four types of brains would be um, receptive to electroconvulsive therapy for treatment in depression. And although it was a pretty small sample size, it was a good indication that they were right. And so, again, like these are the things that I love hearing about, I like talking about, and to see there's practical application out there that can make huge progress in the way that we've been doing things. And, and it's always this idea of, well, we've been doing it this way for a long time. How can we do it better? Why haven't we done more than we've already done? And so, again, if you have examples of machine learning that you think are really cool, I would love to hear more about them. And I want to, um, I want to know what you have. So you can throw it in the chat here, or if you find one later, feel free to drop that on Twitter, and then that way we can all share um, those as well. I'm just gonna um, pause for a second and get a drink of water because I've been talking for a long time.
if you have questions, again, feel free to throw those in the chat and we can um, explore those as well. <laughs> my water matches my background. It's, it's my, my whole aesthetic, I think. Or it's just a coincidence. It could be that too. Um, all right, let's see here. So that was our pause for our um, sponsor message, right? And there was a sponsor message in there somewhere. Um, this pot, this live stream is brought to you by, I don't know who it's brought to you by, but you can let me know if you know who it should be brought to you by. And I'm going to drop another link in the chat. So here's some docs for, if you want to learn more about TensorFlow. Sorry, I was looking at the chat. I was confused by what was happening there. Um, by Pepperidge Farms. <laughs> I, will, I will attempt to get ahead of Pepper, get a hold of Pepperidge Farms, and we will figure out how they need to use machine learning in TensorFlow.js. Let's do that. Let's build a pitch and get Pepperidge Farms to, <laughs> to support this live stream. Um, sticky notes, that would be a really good one. I, I need to get some better sticky notes behind me, some better messages. So also, if you have messages that I should put on sticky notes behind me as an Easter egg for anybody watching later who wants to zoom in, send me the Easter eggs for my post-it notes and then maybe that'll be part of the giveaway. Whoever can find the Easter egg on the post-it note will be the winner of the giveaway that live stream. Um, <laughs> all right, we, we've got a lot going on in the chat and, and thank you for everybody who is here right now distracting me. Um, this, is, this is awesome. Brought to you by Good Hydration. Absolutely. Brought to you by some... Um, probably contaminated tap water because I live in Ohio and the, the pipes here aren't that great. <laughs> so, uh, okay, a little bit more about TensorFlow. What is it? Well, TensorFlow is a software that we use to create machine learning models for desktop, web, mobile, and cloud. And this is one of the things that I really like about being able to use TensorFlow.js because I don't know Python. A lot of machine learning is done in Python. Um, I went to bootcamp. I'm a front end developer. I know JavaScript, but I'm really interested in machine learning. And I'm being interested, I am interested in being able to work with data, which I think is, is really cool. And so the nice thing about this is because it's a JavaScript library, I have access to using this and to learning new things with it. And so, you know, one of the, the nice things is I don't have to learn a new language to use it and I can have a voice in the space of machine learning as a front end developer. And I like that that provides diversity, I think, into the whole machine learning um, In my mind, I want to say genre, but that's not, I'm not an English teacher anymore. Um, industry, the whole, everybody that's doing machine learning, um, when you have a variety of voices, people from different backgrounds who are using the tools, who are thinking of the applications, then you're better able to grow and do new and cool things and to find ways to make it a more equitable space. And so... This is really why I love TensorFlow.js, although TensorFlow.js doesn't like my M1 MacBook very much. And so I found that a lot of troubleshooting had to be done to get some things up and running, but we will get them up and running. And if you're going to do it along with me too, um, feel free to give me your questions if you're having trouble navigating, getting started with TensorFlow.js uh, because I, I spend a number of hours trying to get things up and running. And I, like I said before, I don't know all the answers, but I might be able to help you out a little bit. Um, yes, thank you. 
Yeah, I will repeat everything that I said in the last 32 minutes. I think that that would be a very good use of my time. Um, <laughs> or, or I could just keep talking about the other things that we're going to talk about on this stream. Um, yes, Pepperidge Farms will be sponsoring us as soon as we send over our amazing proposal that's probably generated um, through machine learning by looking at other successful proposals and substituting the word pepperoni in for something else somewhere. Um, <laughs> The other thing that I think is cool about TensorFlow.js is there's lots of pre-existing projects and models and data sets, and we can use these and we can play with them and we can adapt them to what we are looking at or what we're interested in. And there's lots of pre-trained models and code examples out there, which is really nice. And I really like that, you know, it's a, it's a developing space, but there's also a space for hearing more voices and, and doing new things. And so some of the things that we'll be doing on the stream, we'll be doing image classification, we'll be creating tensors, we'll be learning some of that vocabulary, um, loading, teaching, training models, data analysis, uh, all of these things I think will be really, really fun. And last year, my um, now 12 year old, he had his first science fair and we did the teachable machine which I think I have a link for that up here somewhere, which turned out to be kind of a disaster. And so now I'm really excited to go back and, and check out the teaching machine and figure out what we didn't do right. So we had, um, we taught the machine to identify whether something was a Lucky Charms marshmallow or Lucky Charms cereal. And we successfully ran it. It was like 80% accuracy the first time we ran it. And then we didn't realize it, but we had to run it another three times. And so um, and by three times, I mean, I think it took about maybe five minutes to sort what we were doing. So it, it took a little bit, um, took a little bit of time. And so then when we ran it again, after we had created um, more data sets that showed this is cereal, this is marshmallow, it did really, really poorly. And our accuracy was really bad. And so I wanna figure out, okay, what did we do wrong? Somewhere along the line, we did not train that model well. So we might, we might dive into that just because it's going to bother me pretty much forever until I can figure out how we did not um, properly do the project and also how I can update the documentation for the teachable machine so nobody else has that same problem again. Um, there are lots of cool projects out there. Like I said, Airbnb uses TensorFlow. That was one of the cool things. One night I was looking through uh, different videos on TensorFlow and my daughter who is 10 and I, we were watching some, we watched some medical uses ones where they were talking about diagnosing COVID based on images of the lungs. There was Airbnb where they were talking about image classification, which was really interesting. So People who um, are Airbnb hosts are supposed to be labeling, I think, all of the images of the photographs that they send, and they don't always do that. And so they were using machine learning to label the images. So, for example, it would know that if there was a toilet, then that was probably a bathroom, um, unless you have a Pittsburgh toilet. And in case you don't know what a Pittsburgh toilet is, you can just Google that. Um, I, I suppose it's a regional thing. Uh, let's see. So hopefully what we'll do and what we'll learn after these series of streams is a better understanding of what AI and machine learning is, some possibilities of using TensorFlow.js, and recognizing where machine learning is at play. So our emails completing sentences for us. Our phone apps are creating, Dan Ott, no, that is not what Heinz Field is called, <laughs> okay? Um, 
I, I think one of the fascinating things is my phone can figure out which one of my, which baby picture is one of my kids. And so um, that, again, is one of those things that that's fascinating to recognize what um, all of these different images and to be able to sort and classify them. I had another example that I was really excited to talk about until the whole Heinz Field thing in the chat. So thank you for ruining that. Um, <laughs> if I remember, I will come back to it. Oh, I do remember it. So what, what I wanted to say was earlier in the year, um, I'm working on this postpartum wellness app, uh, which is a React Native application. I've been working on it very, very slowly for the past couple of years. And I was diving into some research about postpartum wellness. And I found that there is a doctor, I can't remember where she's from and I can't remember her name, but I know that she is using um, machine learning to predict, early predict postpartum depression. And I thought it was really fascinating. So I think the way that it worked was you could hook up your Twitter or your Facebook to their application. And so it would take pre-pregnancy, um, it would take a look at pre-pregnancy posts and post-pregnancy posts. And it would analyze the language that's being used and the um, patterns, the language patterns and the cadence of the speech. And it was pretty accurate in determining whether or not somebody might have postpartum depression. And I just thought, well, this is another one of those things that I wouldn't have thought of as a use case, but that's really, really an interesting application of being able to do that, being able to aid people who, um, don't have those services or are often overlooked in cases. And so, again, these are things that, that really interest me about um, TensorFlow.js. All right. I think this is probably a good time. There's a lot more information in the chapter and there's a lot of definitions. Oh, I did write a blog post that captures some of this stuff too, in case anybody is interested in checking that out, um, that captures some of the definitions. And again, I'm learning as I'm going and I'm trying to simplify these things. So there are very, very complex jokes, um, not jokes. <sighs> This is, this is me trying to read the chat and talk at the same time. I've been doing a good job. Um, <laughs> there are complex ways of describing all of this stuff. Um, and I'm taking it at different levels. Okay, so I want to make sure that everybody feels like they can understand this or can ask a question. And one of the things that I think I said in the blog post is you need to start with suspension of disbelief. And so a lot of this stuff really, really feels like magic. And we'll start to demystify some of that magic as we go through the um, stream series. But we'll, we'll take it down piece by piece. And so it's okay, I think, to jump into something and figure out a little, little by little what's happening there. And in fact, that's one of the ways that I'm really interested in doing things because the magic kind of keeps it exciting. And then you can understand through practical application what these different things are doing. Um, let's see here in the chat. I wonder if that's something that could be applied to a therapist's office to be able to tell if someone is dealing with depression in real time. Um, absolutely, I think so. And you know, in... In a therapist's office, you're often doing those intakes too. And I wonder if we can look at, at the things that are written there too and do some um, – now my, my brain is not working. <laughs> if we can take what people are writing and – look and see if there are warning signs there or if there are things that we should be aware of really quickly. You know, especially for, 
I know my mom is a therapist at a university and they have so many people on the waiting list. Even to help sort through a waiting list a little bit, I know that seems kind of um, tricky or it's not not the best, but having a waiting list is not the best. Trying to figure out how to prioritize who gets seen could be uh, another form of an application there. Yeah. So to do, let's see. So I think, yeah, those are kind of the overviews of the overview of what we're going to be doing here. I've got a couple of things that I want to show you, maybe. Somehow I accidentally always trigger the um, dictionary on my MacBook. I'm not really sure why. Oh, wait a minute. Now I lost my stream. Okay. Is there anonymous practice data available? Probably, and that's one of the things that I was looking for. Um, I was looking for obstetrics data sets to help better understand what to look for in these things. Um, so I'm sure that there are places that you can look for all of that information, and that would be something um, something that I'll look into for next stream to see if I can find some more on that. Let me try to share my screen so you can see a little bit more about what is happening. Um... Okay, here we go. Okay. Can you see my screen? It should be a code pen um, for TensorFlow.js. Can somebody in the chat let me know, please? Yes. Thanks, Nick. Um, so one of the things that I, I like is that this can get be go get up and running really quickly. And TensorFlow.js has this code pen. There's some things there that you can do, and there's a lot of cool resources. Um, they tell you whether or not something is easy or what you can expect, and there are some demos there. And I've got some stuff picked out here. So let's see, this is um, image classification. This is one of the things that we'll be doing uh, and I'll show you how to do this. We'll work through coding examples, I think starting next, um, next time, next stream. And so here we go, we've got, um, so what this is doing is it's going to take an existing trained model and identify the images that we see here. And so here it can tell you that it is a dog with, and it tells you the percentage of confidence. And we'll look at this as we go through the book. Um, I'm not sure which chapter, there's an example that I'm pretty sure is similar to this that, tell, that breaks it down a little bit. So we can understand, okay, how does that recognize that that's a dog? And how do we get these bounding boxes around the, the dog and the percentages? And so, We'll get to that too. Let's see here. Will AI tell us dogs are better than cats? Well, probably not because I think that um, cats are, are probably better than dogs, um, especially hairless cats. Oh, I wanna do image classification of hairless cats. That would be fun. Um, so it's pretty sure that this is a cat uh, and 97% sure that that is. <laughs> um, a cat too. So we're going to be doing some things like this. I can't get my webcam to work on this right now, so I'm not sure there's a setting somewhere that I need to change. But again, we're going to be working through some things like this. Let's see. Oh, this one is pet cam. Oh, this is fun. So this is from Jason Mays. He's a senior developer advocate, I think, for TensorFlow.js at Google. And so I'm, let's see here. 
welcome, allow access. Okay, so this is fun. Now you see my face twice and maybe it's a little bit creepy. Now select what pet you want to recognize. Well, we're gonna say that um, I'm the pet here and alert me when the pet is near my cell phone. Okay, so now here you can identify me and then I'm gonna put my cell phone up to my head. Can it recognize me? Do you recognize my cell phone? Maybe I have to hit the red button. There we go. Now it sees it's a person, and now it sees that there's a cell phone. So it's recognized that, and now there's nothing there. Let's see. I've got my phone. It's interesting. So within a certain... Now I, I wonder, so I've got, I've got a bar of chocolate. Let's see if this thinks it's a cell phone. Oh, it thinks it's a cell phone. Interesting. So it's probably, oh, I'd like to break this down and see what's going on there. It's not, see, it's, it's really, oh, it's struggling. 50%, it's not sure, 78%. What else do I have? That can be a cell phone. I've got um, a pair of John Deere um, socks. Can it? Can we trick it into being a cell phone? Well, it's sometimes. There we go. 60, 50 percent sure that it is a cell phone. Um, <laughs> Uh, an ice cream bar. I don't have an ice cream bar, so I, I can't. I can't do that. Let's see. I don't know. T -t try and make a call with the socks. I'm not sure that that will work. Um, <laughs> it is. It is not a goat. That's that's uh, back to figuring that out. Okay, I think that's probably good enough. You don't need to see my face twice on the screen, and especially not this huge. So <laughs> let's go uh, and X this out. I think that this one's pretty fun, and I would like to play with it some more. I want it to stop seeing my face, though. Um, <laughs> now, okay, so one of the things that I always thought was funny is, um, so I run virtual coffee, um, I'm a room leader there pretty much every Tuesday and Thursday of the week. And when my kids are home, I frequently am known to do the mom face when they come in the room. So like to give them the look like, hey, I'm in a meeting. You need to get out of there. And somebody had mentioned a couple of times, we need to get some image recognition. When I give the mom look, it automatically mutes Zoom because there have been a couple of times where I have yelled at my children when I thought I was muted um, for everyone to hear. So that, um, so I, I think that, that we really need to uh, develop that. Um, let's see here. Okay, so this is uh, one more, I think this is the last image classification. Um, so this does a really nice job of breaking things down. And so all of these labels here will be so, are something that's probably part of um, how the image classification is happening. So it's already built in. <laughs> there's, yes, Dan, there's also a, a, v, a virtual coffee podcast episode where, um, I can't even remember what I yelled. I think it was maybe winter time and I told my kid just to go outside and bare feet. It, I, I definitely 100% sure thought that I was muted on that. So um, if somebody would like to build that image recognition and muting capability for me, I would be very, very happy. Maybe that will be our... Um, project for the end of this stream. Figure out how to mute my computer with mom face image recognition. Um, so here we go. This is pretty decent breakdown. Doesn't have the bounding boxes around the images before. And um, no, the cold is your warm friend. It does not give you frostbite, I have heard. Uh, so this is loading from Unsplash, and then we get to see that it's classifying those images too. And so here's a here's a puppy. 
and I love this. So you can um, take a lot of what is already out there and you can make it more specific to what you want as well. I heard somebody was using machine learning to update their transcripts for their podcasts because the transcript software wasn't doing a great job. So they were using their voice and trying to program it that way. And they said they were able to make it a little bit better, improve the accuracy, but it was it was very time intensive and and not necessarily worth it. So so we've got the breakdown of, of maybe what type of dog that we see here. Let's see what else we've got. Oh, there we go. Uh, cliff drop. I think that's kind of terrifying. And let's see, puppies. Do we have more puppies? Oh, look how cute. Miniature poodle, toy poodle, cocker spaniel. Um, see, this is the fun stuff, just figuring out what the puppies are. Oh, look, a miniature pincher with a plastic bag and a lab coat. <laughs> So again, we'll learn how to dig into some of these things and try and figure out what's going on. Well, the image that was here earlier was really funny because the classification was very, um, very random. So what do we have? A wig and see, things like that are certainly problematic. Cell phone, there's no cell phone, but her hand is by her ear. And I'm not sure what that last word even is. Let's see. Um... Nope, again, oh my, this is getting a, getting a little off there. Classifier. So again, you can see like there, there are some things that are going to be really accurate. There are some things, other things that are not going to be really accurate. And I think that we're going to explore a lot of that as we go through the stream and figure those things out. So... Let's see. Nope. Um, uh, stop sharing my screen. Now I'm just a little person in the screen. Let's see. I can't I can't figure out how to make it go back to. <laughs> to the way that it was before. Um, so hopefully you all can still hear me. Okay, so if you are watching this screen, this stream, I have yet to do my giveaway yet, but I will say if you go on to Twitter, And you, um, let's see here. I'm trying to find a link for you. Copy link to tweet. If you post a um, question or an application of um, machine learning that you're interested in as a response to that tweet, I will randomly choose someone to send our very, very awesome first set of prizes to. And that is, um, you can see what those prizes are um, if you watch Gant's video message, which is also on Twitter that I tweeted yesterday. So I think that's probably it for today unless there are other questions or comments that anyone has. So I'll give you a second. If you want to add something in the chat, feel free to go ahead and do that now. And you are welcome to distract me now because I will just focus on the chat. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. This was incredibly nerve wracking uh, because I am not used to live streaming or talking this long. Um, the next couple of streams will have more coding and we'll have more demonstrations. But this one again was just kind of an overview of what I am going to be talking about, letting you know some of the history 
and talking through some of the things that um, I hope that you'll join me through it for next time. Ah, oh, thanks, Ian, for being here. And I also have to figure out um, how to do all of this Twitch stuff and send it over to YouTube as well. Yes, don't forget to hit that follow button. Like and subscribe. Is that how you do it? I don't think you subscribe on Twitch, right? Yeah, I well, I hope that it only takes me a few streams to get used to it. I just get very easily distracted by chat sometimes. And so I have to figure out that balance of, of moving my focus back and forth. So I also want to say thank Gant Laborde. I don't know if I thanked Gant. Thank you, Gant, for uh, helping me with this, for writing the book, and for providing all of the prizes for um, these streams. All right. Well, I think that's it. We went about an hour. It was really, really great to have you all here with me. Um, I'll be back same time next week. So share with your friends and I will talk to you all soon. Bye.